Hey, everybody. Today is Monday, February 6th, 2023. Coming up on the show today, from a man called Otto, editor Matt Chisse. I read the script and I kind of saw the movie when I read the script, which doesn't always happen. Sometimes you read a script and you're sort of like, why are they going to make this? So you set yourself up with the script and anticipating it one way, and then it becomes this totally other thing. And you have to leave the script behind. You have to leave the novel behind. You have to leave the original film behind and just plunge in. You know, the editing room is a weird space and time continuum anyway. You know, when you get in there and you lock into the story that's just kind of constantly unfolding. Yes, all that and a lot more in this edition of The Rough Cut. Well, well, it's podcast time again. How'd that happen? Oh, I know what happened. A week went by. That's how that happened. So let's make it happen and get going with today's show, shall we? Today on the podcast, we are joined by a man called auto editor, Matt Chasse. Yes, I think I said that already. Now, you may recall, you may not, but you may recall Matt's name coming up on the show a short while back when we covered the indie film American Murderer. That particular film was edited by Matt Allen, who, in that interview, talked to us about assisting Matt Chasse on the film Christopher Robin. And Matt also did some VFX editing duties on A Man Called Otto. This film marks roughly the 12th time that Matt, Chesse that is, has worked with director Mark Forster. Some of the films they've done together are Monsters Ball, Finding Neverland, The Kite Runner, Quantum of Solace, and the aforementioned Christopher Robin. A Man Called Otto actually began its life as a Swedish novel titled A Man Called Ove, and then it became a film titled A Man Called Ove. Now, with the help of the Hanks family, Matt and Mark have made their own adaptation of the source material. The film stars Tom Hanks, because why not? It also features Tom's son Truman Hanks as young Otto, who appears in flashbacks. And Tom and Rita Wilson are also producers on the film. In fact, some of Rita's songs are in the film, and if you listen real carefully, you may spot another Hanks progeny, I said progeny, not prodigy, hidden somewhere in the needle drops. We'll ask Matt about that. We'll ask Matt about a lot of things. But first, a quick chat about the fine folks who helped to bring you this interview, our friends and sponsor, Extreme Music. Now, in our chat with Matt Jesse, our Chase chat. You're going to hear him talk about some of the challenges he faced in getting just the right track for a scene. Luckily, he was able to go through Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson to come up with a creative solution to that problem. But Tom and Rita aren't producing your movie, I don't think. So you better find another way to musical glory that will make your story sound great without crushing your budget. Well, look no further than Extreme Music. They have a huge catalog of top-shelf tracks from elite musicians and composers. And that catalog could not be easier to use thanks to their incredible search engine. It allows you to search on musical metadata like tempo, instrumentation, lyrics, composer. You just need to tell Extreme Music what you're looking for, or even upload a reference track to them, and they can use their sonic superpowers to find you just what you need. It's simple, yet so very powerful. You can get it all done right there online, or one of their reps can reach out and lend a hand if you need it. So the next time you have a great story to tell, tell it with great tracks from Extreme Music. All right, now that we've dispensed with the formalities, here to talk about cutting a man called Otto is an editor called Matt Chesse. And while we're here, we might as well do that thing where we talk about editing. Yeah. We're going to talk about a man called Otto. I believe I'm at the mercy of IMDb, like a lot of us are, that this is your 10th or 11th film with director Mark Forster dating back to around, I think, 2000. It might be closer to 13 because there's... Really? Yeah, I think there was. I think I took a side credit on something that I brushed up for him that I didn't cut called All I See Is You. I don't know if that's listed as one of my credits with him, but I was tallying and I, I think it's about around 12, 12, 12, potentially 13. Oh, actually, because we have one that hasn't come out yet. Okay. So that's why I think I'm at 13. Suffice to say, it's a lot of movies. It is. It's as long a relationship as, as my marriage. I have a child and a career with Mark and a marriage that are almost all about the same length. I won't ask you to prioritize. Rather... <laughs> Let's talk about how you two guys met that fateful meeting. How did you build this 12, 13 film, 20 plus year relationship that you have? Right. Our Marvel origin story, as it were. We met through a friend, my best friend, Adam Forgash, met Mark at Slam Dance or Lap Dance or some kind of dance up there in the hills of Utah. And uh, he came down with this connection with Mark, having seen Mark's film that was playing there, I think just out of NYU. It was Mark's first feature. 
And they connected and he was speaking about Mark, talking about this guy that he met. They were going to they were going to work on a, on a screenplay. So he and his wife, Kathy Burns and Mark Forster all sat together and put together the script, wrote the script called Everything Put Together, which was a really great piece. Uh, I read it because he was my buddy and I was at a point in editing and he was at a point in screenwriting where we were both trying to launch and do our thing. And I was ready to cut a feature. And I read the script and I kind of saw the movie when I read the script, which doesn't always happen. Sometimes you read a script and you're sort of like, why are they going to make this? And this one was like, like I saw, I saw the film and it had elements of repulsion and it felt a little like Todd Haynes safe. And it was sort of like a movie of the week, disease of the week kind of thing. It was basically about a woman who lose, loses her child to sudden infant death syndrome. And at the same time, she's in this kind of cabal of other women who are pregnant and everybody's having baby showers. And then she has her baby and the baby dies of SIDS and she's immediately sort of ostracized and out of the club because nobody quite knows how to deal with what she's going through. The general vibe is that everybody retreats and she's left alone and kind of descends into this kind of repulsion-esque madness. So I just really loved it. I got all the notes and I just felt the tone and I kind of knew what I thought it wanted to be. And so I remember calling my friend Adam up and I said, I read the screenplay. I got to do this. I see it. I feel it. I want in. And he said, okay, we well, should meet Mark. So I was an editing assistant on TV commercials at the time. And so Mark wisely said, well, why don't we cut something together and see how we vibe in the cutting room? So he brought down the reel of an actress that he knew, a friend of his. He brought her elements in and I digitized them and we chatted and had lunch and I got stuff online and I threw some music in there. I think it was like Hugo Montenegro or some, you know, some sort of Latin jazz sort of thing underneath it. So I got the thing done and we pushed it around and we poked at it and, and he was like, this is really good. I'm having a good time. I like this music. So I won him over and we worked really hard on that film and it got into Sundance. And so I remember him getting the phone call that we were into Sundance and it was the first feature that I'd cobbled together and uh, they were really excited that we were coming. So then I had to get the whole movie delivered because when Sundance says, we like your movie, you know, bring it up, see you in a month. And you're like, wow, it's just a digital artifact. There is no movie. We can't, I have, we have to screen this thing. So then I had to just sort of put my feet in the stirrups and deliver the film out of the avid onto the screen and get it mixed and get it color timed and do all the stations of the cross to get the film finished. And we didn't really have any money at that point. The producers had kind of thrown their hands up. And so I started writing POs from my company without permission. I just found some in a drawer and contacted all my friends who worked in visual effects and titles and sound mixing. And I just kind of said, can I front this stuff? And, and we'll just, we'll work it out after Sundance. And they all said, okay, fine. Cause I had all these great relationships because I was a hardworking assistant. So I did a Hollywood shuffle basically, and just gave them all this bogus paperwork from my company that I was working for. And we got the movie up to Sundance and Mark was just amazed. He's like, where did you come from? Why are you like, you're like this movie's angel. Like, how did I get so lucky? You, you, not, you not only killed it, but you also dragged it up to Sundance on your back, you know? And so we really bonded there. There was a, by the time we came out of the dugout to show the movie at Sundance, I think I'd proved my mettle. And so he parlayed that into Monsters Ball while he was up at Sundance. He met the guys from Monsters Ball and uh, they had gotten their script back once again because they tried to make it four or five times with all these different conglomerations of people. And every time they put the equation together, you know, Sean Penn directing Robert De Niro, it just got too weighted because it was such a bleak story. And so these guys were kind of defeated from having their chain yanked by Hollywood and getting to the starting block and having the movie fall apart. And they saw our movie and they were like, this guy's done this movie for nothing. And he's got a great tone and he's got, he's really made something. You know, th if our movie felt this good, we'd be happy. So they approached Mark with the, with the script. And, um, and so he said, you know, we're going to, I'm going to do this other movie and uh, you're going to come with me. And I was like, well, I've heard that before. And he did. He really stuck to his guns and he defended us. He went into Lionsgate and I think they said something like, we loved your movie. We love this script. We love this project you put together. We love the Halle Berry, Billy Bob Thornton combo thing. And we want to do this, but you probably need somebody more seasoned to shoot it and to cut it. And we're going to set you up with somebody that will bring you into port. And he said, you know, you could do that, but part of the reason you like my movie is because of my crew. And he's like, if you take away my DP and you take away my editor, I can't promise you're going to be so happy with the results as what you're staking me for. Cause that's part of why you like it. 
And they were like, "Whoa, okay, uh, okay. Well, we can always fire them if it's you know if they if we decide to, you know. I guess we can indulge him for now, and we'll and we'll we'll can them later." And so he really stuck his neck out for Roberto Schaefer, who was our DP, and me at the time. And we went on to just you know make six or seven movies in a row nonstop after that. And it was just really fortuitous and and amazing. And just that kind of loyalty and kind of um, paying it forward is rare in this town. And I thought, wow, I made it to Sundance on my first feature. That's great. That's we're at the top of the mountain. And then things kept firing after that in an amazing way. So it was really a, a, a great, a great combo of, uh, of elements. And he just, he's just a very noble, noble guy. And we really, we really, it really stuck. We stuck the landing together. You mentioned you read a script. Sometimes you do see the movie in your head. Sometimes you don't. Well, let's talk about A Man Called Otto or A Man Called Ove as it was originally a, a book and then a, I believe a Swedish film. Yep. When you read the script for A Man Called Otto, did you see the movie and what did you see? Hmm. Good question. Well, I knew this is a second time we've done an adaptation from a book. We did The Kite Runner, which was a novel. And this was the first time we've done that one that was more or less a remake of a movie that already existed. So you already have a lot of um, material to dive into. Um, and it, it sort of takes the weight off of maybe the screenplay that's coming in. Cause you're like, you not only get to read the screenplay, but you can also take a whiff of this or take a whiff of that. You know, I certainly, I read the novel and I, I watched the film because um you know, we were working with David McGee, who adapted the movie and the novel kind of together to make Otto. And um, we had worked with him on Finding Neverland. So there was a previous relationship and a, a previous confidence there. So I knew that the script was going to have legs and it, it played great. You know, I think that I've come to a place where when I read a script, I'm more or less flagging things that I think are going to be editorially challenging or trying to note to mark things that maybe other people don't see because I'm looking at it from a purely editorial lens, really, when I'm reading it. You know, I mean, I take the ride when I read the script, but I'm also marking off things like the number of times we go into flashbacks or the number of times that, you know, we wind up in this particular location. And is there a redundancy or do we need this scene or are we only there just to get them to say this particular line or how we, you know, do, yeah, I, I, try to, I try to look for things that are going to bite me in the ass later on and flag them both to Mark and to David McGee. Cause Mark creates a very open, you know, there's a lot of camaraderie and a lot of, it's a very level playing field. So everybody's allowed to weigh in and kind of offer their perspective and everybody's a potential audience member. So I sort of read it and give my notes to Mark and then I let him filter through the things that are applicable or that, you know, strike him like, Oh, that's a good point. I should pass that on to David. Or sometimes he'll just say, right, right to David and bring this thing up. Like, I think one of the things I noticed was people were saying, oh my God, or oh God, a lot. And I know that that could become almost like a swear word at some point, you know, and you have to start trimming those things back. And I was like, well, if these get totally embedded and we can't cut the scene without, and we actually do tally this number of oh gods or oh my gods, it could be a problem for me. And I'll have to ADR around that and all this stuff. And, you know, and, and it does it set off a whole tribunal about bringing that down. So I did mention that to David, you know, these, these, so it's, it's weird. It's nitpicky stuff that I see that stands out to me. I love the script. It was a package deal with all the other elements that were coming together. So I was really excited. It seemed like a, a home run basically with Tom Hanks in the role. And I think the main thing that I was concerned about not concerned about, but the thing I was looking forward to, the expectation was who was going to play Marisol, the neighbor who moves in and kind of brings him back to life and is sort of like the foil, the catalyst, the provocateur for, for Otto's character. So I was like, I can see Tom Hanks doing this. Who is the woman that Mark's going to find? And Mark is an amazing caster. He casts really well and he discovers people. And there's something, I think a mixer, our, our mixer, Laura Hirschberg mentioned it one time. She's like, I really love working on Mark's movies because he always has somebody very recognizable in the main role that kind of gets things on the track and gets people in the door. But then he tends to populate the movie with people you haven't seen before, both, you know, their nationality or their profile or their, you know, their exposure. He just tends to cast a lot of strangers in the movie that allow you to really soak into it and kind of forget that the Tom Hanks, America's sweetheart is playing this role because he disappears into this cast of characters. And I think that's a great thing that he does 
So I was waiting to see who he was going to bring in. And he found this woman, Mariana Trevino, through his casting agent, who he has a really solid relationship with. And I think she auditioned on an iPhone because it was kind of at the end of the pandemic. And, you know, he knew that she could do the comedy, but he was wondering about the dramatic scenes. And so she did a iPhone performance of, uh, of one of the scenes that she played all the characters and just nailed it. And everybody was just electrified. And he said, stop, I don't need to see anybody else. It's her. It's going to be her. And she turned out to be like a real magical ingredient in the movie. And I was so glad when, when they filled her in. So that was, that was my main coming away from the script. That was my main question was who's going to be Marisol. I don't know. I find you can read a script and you can anticipate what's coming and then the reality of it is when you get the dailies every day, it's kind of like opening Christmas presents. You just don't know what exactly is going to be in there. And scenes that you think are going to be your favorite scene or a scene that you're looking forward to on the page can come in with a different flavor or a different tone or be sort of a minor note. And then other things that you pass by that didn't affect you or didn't, you know, you didn't find put emotion in or that, that you weren't excited about can wind up being a really saucy, incredible main course of a scene. And so you're always recalibrating when you're getting the dailies like, oh, I didn't think it was going to go like that. Or wow, well, you know, how do they find this in that scene? I didn't see that coming. So there's, it's, it's great. I think that's one of the things that makes the collaborative nature of the editing process so great is that there's so many different sort of interpretations and twists and turns and augmentations from everybody's viewpoint and standpoint. And you wind up with this sort of smorgasbord of things to choose from, but it's all these different intentions and all this different artistry that comes together. And so it's, it's always, it's always more than the sum of its parts, you know? So you set yourself up with the script and anticipating it one way, and then it becomes this totally other thing. And you have to leave the script behind. You have to leave the novel behind. You have to leave the original film behind and just plunge in. I asked you about the script and the angle you took wed towards casting. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you did because hearing your answer about the casting reminded me of something. I think it was uh, John Ottman when he won the Eddie in his speech, he talked about the casting and he's like, you know, there's just not much I can do as an editor. And if the casting's not right. And with a script, there are things that you can do in editorial. There are things that you can do in collaboration with the director to fix those things. Considering the relationship you do have with Mark Casting choices, is that something where you'd be overstepping your bounds or is that something where an editor really should have at least the chance to offer some input? That's a really interesting question. And I think it's a good thing to scratch on that you bring up. I, in my personal experience, I have had some challenges along the way, even when I was sort of in production and I was a, a first AD on a film and the director was uh, was a friend of mine and it was and I'm, I made some casting. I weighed in because I'm a big film head. I'm a big film nerd. And so I think at this, on this particular juncture, it was like, should we cast John Voigt as the dad or should we cast Paul Dooley? I remember this pretty distinctly. And I love Paul Dooley from Breaking Away. And John Voigt was in sort of a mid transitional period. And he hadn't been in a lot of th stuff at the time. And being conferred with, I pushed for Paul Dooley, but the person wound up casting a very different actress for the mother. And so we wound up with this odd couple and I was like, Oh, you know, and then we were living with Paul Dooley who I love, but I was like, I wish I hadn't stepped into this. You know what I mean? Like I just, I, I wish that I had let nature take its course because that's a huge decision. And when you, you can't kind of unroll that and you open your mouth and you, you know, I, I always have a lot of ideas about casting, but when it comes down to Mark, I kind of leave it alone because if it's my idea, you know, or the editor's idea, that's something that you really have to live with. So it's almost better to dig yourself out of somebody else's choice. It's sort of like a nuclear decision, you know, and I, and I just, it's too, it's too hazmat for me. And I don't want to be trying to cover for that choice the whole time and be like, I got to make this work because it was my idea. So I tend to stand back. But we banter about it and I weigh in. But a lot of times it's gone the other way where I was really gung ho on a particular actor and we wound up for, you know, practicality reasons going with somebody else in the lead and, and you dirty the waters by politicking too much for one thing or the other, depending on how things turn out. So it's a tricky one. You know, something that you bring to the table, it's a little different than a lot of editors, is you own this beautiful post-production facility in L.A. called Assembly Hall. Mm -hmm. The film was mostly shot in Pittsburgh, I believe, and I think you cut it in London. So as usual, I'm missing something here. Could you fill in the blanks for me? How is it that um, you have this gorgeous facility in, in Los Angeles, the film shot in Pittsburgh, and you cut it in London? <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't make much sense. 
we did the last film that hasn't come out yet. That we we've already had one in the in the bank. We cut that at Assembly Hall, and it worked great. And Mark loved being at the facility. We could have done auto at my place, but basically the financial landscape of the movie. We were partnered. Uh, it was Playtone, which is Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson's company and Gary Gutsman's company, co-parenting with this company from Sweden who did the original film, SF Films. Frederick Wickstrom Nicastro was our producer who also produced Ove. And based on the fact that um, Tom and Rita wanted to approach the book and the material, they met the Swedish company who had produced the original film who had the relationship with Frederick Backman and had already made a, a two other films of his novels. So it just made sense to partner with them because they were experienced with the material and experienced with the author and um, brought together, I think, the, the substantiality of the, of the money to get together started. So that, that was the team. And then it became a question of, are we going to cut it, you know, in the U.S., which would probably have been in Santa Monica somewhere, Playtone way, or are we going to cut it in the UK because that company, the Swedish company, represented and was connected with the EU or the UK or some, somehow that that identity of the of the of that company um, was based in the UK, which meant that we could get substantial discounts and you know do all that sort of stuff that would get more money on the screen. It was basically the move the move to cut it in the UK was how we how can we maximize our budget and get the most bang for our buck. And the powers that be decided that way we could do that was to base in the UK for the majority of the editing, you know, the score, uh, sound and mix and color, visual effects. So we, so we, we basically tried to run every, then, so they asked me, would you mind going to, to London to cut the movie in? And I have no problem with that. I'm very familiar with the turf and I'm familiar with the players and the crew. And I have, you know, great cohorts over there, great collaborators. And Mark is the same way. Um, and I think Mark is also a European kind of a guy. He's Swiss German. So basing out of there gives him some geographical proximity that was appealing for the duration of the show. So we just decided to set up in London to accommodate everybody and to make the smoothest you know, situation for the producers. And it worked great. I mean, I was really happy to be there. It's a little disconcerting and it joggles you a little bit to be in Pittsburgh, in the snow, in your screen the whole time and have everything be very mark and, and have everybody, you know, kind of deal, dealing with this, you know, some of the joke of the movie and some of the vibe of the, you know, a lot of the vibe of the movie is American. And then you're pulling back and going for a pint down the, you know, down the pub. And you're like, you know, it just has nothing to do. It's very, it's, 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 it's kind of like makes it a bit sci-fi where you're sort of like, you know, I'm on another planet all day and then I pull out and I'm, I'm here, I'm in London, but I sort of set that aside. It would have been nice to have the whole thing feel a little more blue collar and to be a little, a little more American based, but you roll with it. You know, the editing room is a weird space and time continuum anyway. You know, when you get in there and you lock into the story that's just kind of constantly unfolding. It was mildly disconcerting to not be in America and to have to bring the American from within me while I was having a great time being a Yank in London. But I worked it out. And I think the movie is, is stronger for it. We had great people, top drawer, sound crew. And so it was fine. I love London. Happy to be there. So whether it's London or back home in Assembly Hall or even Pittsburgh, how do you like to have your avid set up? How do you like to have the working environment so that you can be creative even in this environment where time seems to stop existing? Mm, good question. Um, well, I have been lucky enough to create a permanent space, more or less, at Assembly Hall, which is next door to my house, and be able to craft it exactly how I would want it to be. So I have to move stuff around a lot less now when I can when I can line up with it. But basically, when my wife and I adapted the house um, to be a cutting rooms as a as a way to kind of keep keep our relationship with this new property that we bought, it, it was specified by her that it couldn't just be my wacky kooky man cave. It had to be available to other people and function as a full fledged facility and not just be corked out to my taste. So we did it proper and we built it up so that anybody could use it. And we've had a great luck with it. It's been, it's been really embraced and been full, you know, we hasn't really been down at all. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, DreamWorks and Lionsgate and Netflix and, you know, a bunch of different shows in there. Everybody gives us 
high marks and we have a, you know, we haven't had any return clients because uh, just the cycle of it, but, but every, everybody has dug it. We haven't, we haven't had a, a bum show or a bummer in there or anybody be bummed out, but I'm really happy when I'm there because I'm right next door and it's very me. So what I try to take from that, if I'm not working there, which is fine, I usually bring in some comfort. If I'm, if I'm in my own country, uh, if I'm in the driving vicinity of LA, I will bring in usually a stereo system, uh, a turntable, some speakers, and uh, some artwork, and uh, some lamps. I'm very light centric. I'm very much about lighting, and I get weirded out if I don't have the right vibe of lights and just sort of comfort. It's sort of when I pull away from the screen, I need to have a certain zone of lighting and just sort of ambiance. So I tend to probably to the debt, you know, to pro- probably to the detriment of, my, of my, my wife's opinion, I move too much stuff in. I kind of get a little too comfy, but I have had the experience where I'll be working in a f- naked facility that's very generic and people will come to my room and open the door and be like, what's going on in here? Is this, is this Bay three? Like, I don't, <laughs> where are we? And, it, and, and it's because I, I do kind of take it over. Lighting and a couple of paintings and a good mid-century chair can just do wonders. I usually have a teapot in there and uh, just kind of a little bit of creature comfort. I have a pretty normal, avid setup. I've got the big client monitor. I don't like to have people looking into my avid. I like to be kind of have eye contact with people where I've got an easy pivot to them to make eye contact and discuss stuff. But when I go back to cutting... I like to have something for them to look at that's not me and my back and my desktop and what I'm doing. I, I'm very presentational. It's a little more Wizard of Ozzy, sort of uh, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. I like to you know, go into my, my zone. One thing I always have to do is have the guys who are setting up the Avid. I work with Digital Vortex. They're our partners next door. So um, they tend to be the ones setting up my avids. But I always have to have the sliders on the board set up so that I can dim the avid and put my headphones on. I've usually got headphones on when I'm cutting most of the time. So I'll have a discussion about something, take a note, go after it, and I'll just turn the sound down and go into my headphones so that the room is quiet and I can do my wiki wiki and then turn around and present it. So I would say the internet and um, social media and things like this have made it a lot easier to distract people from what you're doing and let them have their own space and go into their zone. I remember when Mark and I first started working together, it was early days and he found a video game called Snood that was uh, on a monitor, on a computer, on like an old Mac something or other, you know, one of those crazy ones. It's like bright pink or bright blue. I don't remember what those are called, but they were like on this particular The shape. original IMAX, yeah. Yes, yeah. The original IMAX was down the hall and it had snood on it. And and so he would go down and play snood. I'm going to go snood. And it, it was like code word for I'm going to let you do your thing. And now we can all snood out on our on our phones. So it's it's easy to say, cool, let me work on that and dip the sound, put my headphones on and go into my zone and not be self-conscious about making the moves. So, you know, dim the room and be on my headphones and have my lighting and a teapot. I could make any room work for me pretty quickly. Mark is the one who's very architecturally and aesthetically specific. So when I scout our rooms, I can always use him as a pry bar and say, "Mm, I don't think the director would be okay with this. The feng shui is off. Like I scout out our rooms and I always find a great space that is comfortable for Mark to do his thing. Because what Mark does when I'm cutting most of the time is he tends to have meetings and cook up something for the next project. So he uses it as a, you know, HQ for gestation process of, of, um, rather than waiting till the movie's done to go, you know, begin something else, he's usually got something in the cooker. So he's sort of speed dating and he's got people coming in out of the cutting room. So I know that I need to create or, you know, locate and land a space that he's going to feel reflects his vibe and that he's going to be able to welcome people and, you know, open my door and be like, and here's Matt cutting. And then he goes off and does his thing. And so I got to get him a good room. I got to get me a good room. I've got to have a certain, uh, remoteness. He like he like he's a very private person. So he likes to be not inaccessible, but just in his own space. Doesn't really like to be on a lot. Doesn't really like to be, you know, 
you have basically have to call and ask for permission to come over and visit. And that that's just like his comfort zone, you know, which I think is, I think makes sense. And I think it, after the, the, the years of being in this business and, and sort of being too accessible, it, you kind of get that thing of you, I'm going to wall, wall myself in a little bit and I, you, you can get to me, but you got to, you know, jump the wall to get in here. And, and I think that that's fine. I think it's, 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 part of his that part of his creative process has become part of my creative process. So we like to have a little bit of, of, of independence and individuality. For the uninitiated, which is code for me saying, I really should know this, but I don't. <laughs> the role of the post-production supervisor, wouldn't that fall under their jurisdiction? Does an editor typically get tasked with, hey, find us some great places to live for the next year? I don't know how other people work. I, I know that we're finicky. Um, and that we're, you know, we're particular and those are kind of words that I would use if I got on the horn with a post supervisor. And, um, I, I know that, uh, it's important cause I'm going to be there for a long time and, uh, and I know Mark really well. So, um, I have walked into places that where they have tried to just set us up and walked in and been like, this will not do, you know, l- let me look. But generally I just try to get ahead of it by, um, connecting with the person from the studio who may or may not be our post supervisor, but may be, you know, the head of posts assistant or something. And, and I try to get out there early and just, um, and just run around and, and, and look at, look at places, open, open a handful of doors. I'm so lucky now to be able to point people towards my place first and say, this would do, uh, it's great. I know exactly how it'll lay out. It's one, let's just do this. Um, but if that, if we're out of sync or out of phase with assembly hall, I've had enough experience. I don't think I've ever just accepted a, a space and, and been like, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It, it always matters. And so I uh, sort of, it's a, it's a uh, priority for me to, so, to get that, to get that settled. Uh, all spaces are not created equal. And I think what I've learned from assembly hall is that when you can generate creative juice and you can generate uh, comfort and, a sort of a, a camaraderie and and you know something that feeds you back after you're done with your work day or in the middle of your work day when you come out of your room if you can if you can be someplace that gives back to you it really benefits the cutting experience and benefits the movie and makes the long hours a lot easier because you, you know you take a break and you push back from your desk and you walk to the kitchen to get the coffee and if you're walking through a space that supports you and is is nourishing you're like, ah, it's just, it's just great. And I, I think I learned this at Skywalker Ranch. We've mixed a lot of movies at Skywalker Ranch. I think I've done about six or eight movies up there, sometimes for long periods of time. And it's one of the most magical spaces to work that you could ever go to. And the first time we were there, I started dreaming of having like an editing ranch, like they have a sound ranch. They, you can do a lot of things there uh, besides just you know, mixing. Um, there's a lot of, lot of rooms, a lot of, lot of hidey holes, but the feeling of taking your movie to Skywalker and the rest of the world goes away. And the only thing you really have to concentrate on is the film. And if you're mixing all day and you come out at eight o'clock at night and it's silent and, you know, you ride a bicycle back to your air, to your B and B that they have there. And, uh, there's really no other priority there. You don't have to dr- fight traffic. You don't have to, you know, deal with, you know, any, any of the challenges of your regular life. It's like, you just put the movie on hold and you decompress and then you come back to the movie. And I realized what a big contribution that was making to our creative process by going up there. It really became for me when I could pull it off the carrot at the end of the stick of like, okay, the the last couple of months of a movie of, of locking picture can be really intense with studios and test screenings. And I would think, well, I'm going to get to Skywalker at the end of this and everything's going to be okay. And I'm going to be able to just relax into that. And there won't be anything to think about except the sound on the movie. And so I think I tried to carry that over into my editing spaces and into assembly hall in that it sort of cocoons the movie. If you have a place that you're happy to be at and you're not trying to get away from, and that is like hugging you, you know, I think that it just makes you, more adaptable to being there for the amount of time you do and to just have a positive experience. Does that make sense? Everything makes sense to me, Matt. (laughs) Yeah. So it's a Skywalker, it's kind of a Skywalker sensibility that I would try to 
build into wherever we were going and wherever we found we were we found ourselves no matter how remote or how short a time i try to make the vibe and the editing room experience a, a priority i think it pays back and i hear it pays back from a lot of people that sidekick with us i would think so yeah there's a couple of questions that i'm fond of asking required to ask in each interview and they really are about tone Mm -hmm. And I think how you start the movie off is really how you set the tone. So I want to talk about that with Otto. Absolutely. Huge to me. Complicated movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, like the first thing that you as filmmakers tell us about Otto in this wonderful pre-credit sequence, he's simply trying to buy some rope at the hardware store. And then after that, we have a montage where he interacts with his neighbors. And both of those things teach you that this guy is pretty miserable. And then the next thing you tell us after the credits is he's trying to kill himself. And it's a comedy. Exactly. <laughs> So the first time he tries to kill himself, he tries to hang himself. Thankfully, it doesn't happen. He's laying on the ground on top of a bunch of newspapers that he's laid down because he's very fastidious. If he's going to do it, he's going to be clean about it. And so as he's laying on the ground, he's looking at the paper and he clips a coupon because he sees, oh, ooh, there's a great deal on something here. <laughs> so that's a very tough subject to be dealing with and then transitioning like that into comedy. So I'm just going to sit back and let you talk to me about the balance of tone and again, the open. That was a terrific setup. You really got it and you served it up just then uh, with all the shifting tectonic plates that were in that sequence that were the challenges, but the fun of cooking that up because as an editor, you know, I, I knew driving the bus from the beginning of the movie that everything was going to turn out okay and that we were going to come to love Otto. So I think you can afford to let him be curmudgeonly and not uh, soft sell his character to the audience because he's got to have somewhere to go, you know, as a, as a character, he's got to have an arc. And so you want to, you want to start off with him isolated and grumpy and taciturn and exacting and really let people know who he is so that you can let go of that. And so it was important to not soft sell that. The author, Frederick Bachman, who's a wonderful guy and was really embraced the movie said to Mark when he visited set, when they were filming, Mark was talking about Otto's arc and Frederick Brackman said, Otto doesn't have an arc. He doesn't change. He's the same through the whole movie. People just discover him and figure him out that he, he doesn't change. I don't know if I hundred percent agree with that, but I thought it was a really interesting yardstick to gauge the character by and it gave me an excuse to be rather unrelenting with his tone and his curmudgeonliness so i'm going through that opening scene and it it seemed to me the way tom was playing it it's pretty practical where he's coming from he's annoyed by people he's annoyed by this modern world he's annoyed by these sort of shortcuts he's annoyed by this kind of egregious salesmanship that's going on and the sort of the background noise. I decided that Otto had a sound issue. If he's on the spectrum, which I think he is mildly, you know, there's a certain amount of processing, you know, he has a limited bandwidth for certain things. I think his short temper is more about being intolerant because he has certain OCD or, you know, spectrum issues. And I felt like it was sound a lot because Tom reacted to sound and the modern world, kind of uh, his space, his house was very quiet. When he got home, there was no music playing. There was, you know, no, 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 nothing to disturb him. He had, he could control that environment and he chose to make it really quiet. So whenever we were outside his house, where we wind up pretty quickly in the opening sequence, there was a lot of background chatter and a lot of things trying to grab your attention and a lot of things that you wanted to kind of bat away. I tried to build the sound world and the, the visual world a combo of him wishing he could get out of there, wishing he could get away from everybody and everybody's a dope. And so the thrust of that initial scene with those well-meaning, but kind of annoying people behind the counter, what it should do is set you up to side with Otto. You should really be kind of like, I'm with him. You know, this is stupid that I have to pay for two feet of rope and that I'm being charged for that. And so it was easy to get behind Tom and support the fastidiousness and the kind of rudeness of Otto, but also really wanting to make him appealing and kind of like we're on his side. You know, we did try to move that scene. There was some notion that we should open in the neighborhood and the beginning of the movie should be him coming out to the neighborhood, making his rounds, getting to know him in that way silently. And then he goes off to buy the rope. Or actually, I think we tried to move 
the buying of the rope scene after he got fired. I think there was a notion in the notes that perhaps that's what sets him off to go and get his rope that he needs to hang himself with because he's lost his job and been made redundant, as they say in the UK. And now he doesn't have a reason to not take himself out. So we tried to move it. And basically what happened was without hearing his explanation or without being able to bond with him in that hardware store, you watched him do his rounds and you weren't as interested in what he was doing and you didn't really understand his motivation. And we did this kind of lovely, silent thing around the neighborhood where he's, you know, which we set up as a motif where he's, you know, wrangling the gate and he's checking this, and he's checking that, and he's looking at the parking permits. And you get that because you establish in the hardware store that he has this exacting way about him and he's very regimented. And if you didn't have the hardware scene there, that sort of stuff didn't sort of back that first scene up. And so it, it was good to have the pre-scene. And it was also, it was just a great, it was just a great place to enter, enter the movie at because it really set him off against, you know, the modern world and sort of, you really, you get with that dialogue beautifully written by David McGee, you really get the impression of who he is. It sort of says it all. That's when the movie starts and that's, that's who he is. You mentioned the coupon clipping after he tries to hang himself. And I think the biggest affirmation that we got that the suicides were going to work and be okay and be accepted was after he has a flashback and sees his wife and he's kind of knows where he's going. And then the hasp breaks and he falls on the floor. How quick the laughter came when he looks at that coupon, let us know. It sort of lets everybody know, you know, we've got a suicide attempt, which ends in a slapstick way. And then you're free to laugh. And when everybody punches that ticket to laugh at the coupon, then everybody can relax. This is going to be okay. Tom Hanks is probably not going to die by suicide on camera, but he might try it again, but they're looking out for us. So I I think that in setting up a movie, you talk about openings, you do have to show people how the movie is going to play, what the tools and the tone and the languages of the movie, what, what to expect and how to watch it. So I think that we took our time in the opening. It could have gone quicker. We could have deleted some of the beats going around the neighborhood, although by making it a title sequence, you buy yourself a bit of real estate because it's also serving as a title sequence. If we did that cold, if we just had him walking around the neighborhood, it probably would have been a little more wearing. But because we have to have the titles come up at some place anyway, that gives you the real estate to take your time a little bit. And we didn't want to rush Otto's world. We didn't want to rush his interior life, his at-home life, his waking up, missing his wife, the tedium that he was experiencing. And it's hard to do tedium without being tedious. And it's hard to do, you know, uh, we've ha- I've, I've faced challenges like that since Finding Neverland, where you've got, you know, the opens on the playwright having a bad play experience, and you have to show the bad play that he's failing with in order to show the play that he succeeds with, which is Peter Pan. And so we kept getting notes like, why do we have to sit through the bad play? And it's like, it's hard to pull off, but it's important to the story to put people through the rigors of the stuff that you don't want to go through. So there's the pace of his life that we could have made a much punchier and much more kind of sitcom-y or just sketchy. And I think we wanted to be in like second gear, not in fourth gear through that section. So when the family shows up and starts to fill up Otto's life and things become more eventful, that you would feel that the pace had picked up, that he was not in control of the throttle on his life at the moment. These other people were kind of hijacking him. And so we didn't want to get rushed in the beginning. And we got notes about that, about, you know, can we get to this scene sooner? And uh, I think that's one of the, one of the challenges or one of the, the things that you're charged with when you're, doing a movie, tone, pace, all that stuff is to protect the storytelling aspects and not let people rush you along. You know, you got you have to take your time. So I think we, we took our time in the setup and you learn so much. By the time you're done with the opening title sequence, you've met all the neighbors except the family that moves in and you, and you've gone through one full round of his rounds. And then whenever you, drop in on them again and suggest that he's in the middle of them, everybody knows the real estate. We've already established that, and you really only need to do that one full time. 
So it was pretty clear to me what was important and what the canvas that we had to, to paint that on. And, and, and we, we did, you know, that's the original layout, the way it plays now. It was the way it was conceived. It was the way I cut it and showed it to Mark. The whole opening of the movie kind of came together very naturally. We did have a lot of challenges to that and people making suggestions and can you move this and can we tighten this and can we lose some of this? And we adjusted it just minorly, but, but it, it, but it, 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 we did kind of stick to it. It feels the most like the book to me. The opening of the movie feels very much like the book. It feels very Scandinavian and has a chilliness to it, just sort of an austerity. It worked the way it came out the first time. Well, I want to go back to a couple of things that you said in two different answers, actually. You mentioned a bit about auto doesn't really change. And I agree with you. That's kind of a hard thing to validate because, you know, of course, every character has to have a little bit of an arc and auto does have his. But you mentioned reading the script and notating the flashbacks and the number of flashbacks. And I, and I did want to ask you about why is that important to you? Because ultimately, let's say auto doesn't change. Fine. We learn more about him along the way. What changes is what we know of him through the flashbacks. Exactly. I'd love to hear about that aspect, you know, why you were tracking those in the script and how you handled the way that you rolled out what we know about Otto and when throughout the film via those flashbacks. I think the main difference between the novel and the original film, Ove, and our film is that we did make some choices about like how, what, how much flashback to show. There's more backstory and there's some beats that we, that we skipped over or just chose not to go in there. And those discussions probably happened before I came on. And so I was dealing with the choices that they decided to film in the movie. And they're, they're basically, I think there's only one occasion where maybe one or two beats where we pulled out a little bit of young auto and we compressed a flashback that we just felt we'd, we'd are, it became a redundancy. We had sort of an extra beat where she loses her father. We made a little less of the father. We'd filmed some more of him and it just really wasn't necessary. And I think part of that consideration in weaving our screenplay together might've been the idea that you don't really want to spend too much time away from Tom Hanks, because that certainly felt like a thing when we were putting it together there's a, a threshold of how long you're comfortable staying away from the main character and auto in the here and now. And I think the other film and the book divided up the time with the younger auto and the flashback, younger Sonia more generously. I like the balance that we found. You do kind of tend to yearn for Marisol and Otto. That's the main, that's the main relationship. And so there was options in compressing some of the scenes with Truman Hanks, who's Tom Hanks' son, who plays young Otto. The ones that worked the best, like the when he goes out on the date with her, those felt the most important and the, and the sort of meatiest and the most successful in the way that they were delivered, like the charm of the chemistry between actors and stuff in, the, in those flashbacks. There was other stuff that just seemed like it just became exposition. So we just removed some of the stuff about the dad. It's in, the, in the end, something's got to go sometimes. And those scenes didn't really seem to move the movie forward very much, but there were people within the producing camp and people who are really familiar with the source material who, who missed that stuff, wanted to see the stuff with the dad, thought that everything was really adorable and kind of winning and really kind of didn't want to give anything up. And I think that was one of the challenges when you're in the cutting room and you held the material's feet to the fire, you know, as an editor and a director team, you kind of know what the gains are and you can watch the movie very quickly with and without things. And you can, you know, you can know when you come upon it in the timeline, when that scene happens, like, I don't want to be here right now. And I'm going to just take that out. And, Oh, we're not feeling that or missing it. And those accelerations are really important because the deeper you get into the movie, the less time you want to spend kind of going sideways. And I think we've all had that experience where you're watching a film where you're more invested in one plot line or one set of characters than you are in another. And you keep wanting to kind of change the channel when you get into the story that you're not as interested in. Why do we have to be here right now? And so I think you're watching that and you're trying to salt it and get just the right balance and the right amount of flashback. So the main purpose of the flashbacks, yes, is to 
fill in the holes on Otto and realize who he is and what makes him who he is and why he's become this way. And he holds his cards very close to his chest. He doesn't, he's not very disclosive, uh, you know, to, to the people around him. And so he's not very, you know, disclosive to the audience. You know, he's got issues, you know, he's hanging on to stuff, you know, he's got a lot of pain, but he's not the kind of person that is going to let you in too quickly. And so it becomes a bit of a mystery feeling. It becomes a bit, there's clues and there's, indications and and you you see buttons that get pushed in him and he doesn't want to talk about things and he's a little defensive and there's certain places he's not going to go and so the flashbacks are really his interior life and it's the way that you get into him and they also tend to line up with the suicide attempts so i have to say you know selling the suicide attempts as a graphic motif and as a story plot line was a real hot button issue in this movie for the studio for releasing the movie into a culture right now where everybody's got such triggers and buttons that everybody's worrying about why people are might turn on you. And so the people that whose job it is to make sure that you don't get turned on can really make up a lot of reasons why you shouldn't do things or can't do things because we might get canceled and this person might react and we might fall afoul of this group of people or, you know, people might reject it for this reason. And because of the particular culture we're in right now, it's hard to talk people out of those things because you can see what they're, what they're saying. Yes. You can imagine this group of suicide watch people or this people, this, you know, trauma, this trauma group that's triggered by this or that, you can see them banding together and boycotting your movie. And if all you do is spend all your time imagining who's going to turn on the film, it's hard to get out the door. It's hard to get up in the morning. Like, wait, yeah, of course you could wall yourself in and entomb yourself and create a scenario where, you know, old people are going to hate it. Cat lovers are going to hate it. Suicide experience. You know, there's a million reasons not to do particular things. And I think that's the death of art. If you let that be your guiding light, and I understand why it's certain people's jobs to watch out for that, but it's our job as artists and storytellers and creative people to protect the material and push back and say, this has to happen. This is the reason that the story means something. And this, if you pull all the teeth, you're going to wind up with a movie that looks closer to a bit like the trailer feels like. It's a very happy trailer. It's a very easy trailer. It's a very non-challenging trailer. It's about a grumpy old man who adopts a cat and then meets his wacky neighbors because it's scary to say he's going to climb up on a chair and put a noose around his neck. I get that, but the movie can't cave on that where you lose what's important. And I don't think that the suicide ultimately in the movie is what people walk away with. You know, suicide is the villain of the movie and suicide loses and life wins. And I think that 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 was proved to us time and time again when we tested the movie. People didn't think of it as that Tom Hanks suicide movie. It's a very affirming movie. But with people who are anxious about marketing the potentiality of suicide, you have to work together. You have to ease people. Everybody's got to come to the same place. And it's a lot of money that's going to get spent to promote it. And people have to feel confident about that and not scared that they're handing a stick of dynamite to their promo team. And so it was a long process to get, even knowing that we had a novel that featured suicide and another film that featured suicide, somehow the idea that that was all going to land in our movie as well was troubling for people. And I think we we worked hard to keep it all respecting the source material and keeping it all together and making the statement that Mark wanted to make. And there were some concessions, but I'm pretty happy with where we got to with it. But it was it was the main bulk of the work of the movie was to get it past the censors in a way, you know. I think that's an age old story, but it's a sticky wicket and it was a real learning experience to to keep patient and go through it with everybody. Well, I can't think of a better way to end any discussion than on a note of life wins. But I do have one more thing I wanted to work in. And that is, you know, you mentioned that young Otto in the flashbacks played by Truman Hanks. You wouldn't think a a Tom Hanks movie would, you wouldn't think about Easter eggs in a Tom Hanks movie. But there is another sonic Easter egg that I would just love to hear you explain. Yes, I think you're referring to Chet Hanks' White Boy Summer. I think I am which got woven into the fabric of the movie. And I was very excited that it found its its place because it is a family 
it's a family film that was that is largely made by a family. You know, you have a husband and wife producing team, and two of their kids, uh, you know, wound up contributing to the body of the movie, which was great. I kind of built a motif with um, Mike Barbiglia's character, who's the douchey real estate guy who's uh, kind of rolling through the neighborhood. And I, I wanted to sound him with music that this type of guy would would have. So I had a bin called like douche tunes or something of just jer- 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 jerky guy music and like what they what he would think was cool that really didn't that he didn't really earn in any way. He was not he was not a tough guy. So I I bounced a lot of music off that. I had Rage Against the Machine. I had you know some some real macho you know, kind of punchy or fratty, not that Rage Against the Machine is fratty, but I, I, I tried a lot of different things. I had Eminem, you know, like what kind of music, what kind of music would this guy think was cool that would signal who he is and also be totally not Otto's vibe and, and, and be that music, that audio trigger for Otto where it's just like, how can you listen to that? You know, it's like, that's everything I hate, you know, pressed into a song. And so I basically, when you're cutting, you can put anything in. It's free. So I had, I think I had an Eminem song in the first slot, and it really, the, it's an Eminem song. I actually can't remember the name of it, but it ends with him going, yeah, 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 yeah. And so that was kind of playing as he drove away over auto, kind of looking after him as the car retreated. And it worked great. Mark loved it, you know, just this, uh, it was kind of a nose thumbing sort of a soundtrack that was very irreverent and kind of blowing off auto's you know, request for, for, for attention. So it stayed in there for a long time and it got down to the wire where we were kicking songs out and finding library tunes or, you know, what's, what songs are important. Well, obviously the Kate Bush song is important. We had a McCartney track, but it's by the fireman, which is his alter ego. That was important. So we were sort of putting things on the scales and it was like, well, Eminem song is really expensive and it's really just a, it's kind of a placeholder. What can we put in there? And so I reached out to Rita me and Matthew Schreyer, who is our um, music supervisor, he and I kind of cooked up the idea together. Wouldn't it be great to get a Chet song in here that had that kind of macho, modern kind of bravado kind of rap? And it just was like a good it was the it was a good beat. And I just thought how great that Tom is like tapping on this window and trying to get through to this guy and the songs playing in his face. And it's just one more Hank's bell to ring to ring although i think chet uses an x and so um for hanks and so we reached out to rita and she was like well you know i'll get you hooked up but there's there's some explicit so, you know gotta be careful there's some explicit lyrics and you gotta weave your way through it and sidestep that stuff and uh but we could probably get it for a good deal it fit our budget and the meta-ness of it and the it was a bow on that idea that we reached and started to, trying to outline that character and his arrival and his trumpeting himself that to get, to get the Chet song in there was just, it was great. It wasn't, it was, it was an Easter egg, but, but most importantly, and certainly for Mark, it fit the creative edict. The other thing that I really loved about it was the, he's singing about California and Malibu and partying and bottle service kind of lifestyle while this guy's bundled up in this kind of, you know, real estate jacket in this car on a frozen street in Pittsburgh. It's just, if you catch the lyrics coming through and I actually had to get the mixer to kind of clarify it a little bit. I'm like, I don't futz it too much. Cause I want the lyrics to be in there. Cause I sort of, I sort of slid it around so that the rhyming of, of the, the freestyling about, about Malibu and stuff would, would stand out as he's, as Tom's walking away in the car and trying to, you know, close the gate and stuff. Cause I thought it was so, it was just so funny. This guy was just like, that's what's keeping him warm in his frozen car is this idea of the elusive white boy summer that is out there happening in Malibu for other people. And I just, I just, I love that. It's, I mean, these are, there's so many things when you're working on a movie that will really only matter to you in the long run, but they do get through. They do, they do, they do find their level subconsciously and, you know, it, it, it all matters. It all adds up. And, and but that kind of attention to detail and that meta-ness of it and the joke of it, but also the appropriateness of it and the kind of just the it, it's just a kind of lovely it's kind of a lovely tapestry that that all comes together in the end. Every choice is important. And I, I you know, I could probably be guilty of overthinking things. But in the end, when you step back, it, it's it's very gratifying to know that the, all those little 
all those little tweaks uh, that you built in that people people find them and they you know they they contribute to the whole to the whole experience. If the movie is a success, it's a it's a sum of all those all those little parts and every little thing that you added in and worried about and sweated about and politicked for. You know. Well, Matt, the movie is a success, and that is due in large part to all the things that you politicked and fretted about and worried about and all the time that you put in and, and balancing that tone. So congratulations on making it through another one and having it turn out great. Let's do this again, but next time let's do it at Assembly Hall. Excellent. Hey, you're welcome. Anytime. When I get the keys back, I'll let you know. I'm there. Yes, we should definitely do something at Assembly Hall. That would be cool. It looks like a beautiful space and a great place to cut a movie or even record a podcast. I'll keep that in mind. In the meantime, please join me in offering a big thank you to Matt for talking with us about A Man Called Otto. Now, no matter what they call you, what matters most is that they call you. And when they do call, you better be ready. And by ready, I mean having your media composer skills in order. How do you do that? Well, I would start by going to avid.com and getting your hands on the latest version of Avid Media Composer and becoming familiar with all the latest features and functionality. As always, check out the link in the show notes that will zip you right over there. Don't zip just yet. I want to say goodbye first. So, goodbye for now. I hope to see you back here again next week for another interview with the best and brightest stars in our post-production galaxy. Oh, that sounds nice. Until we meet again, this is Matt Fury thanking you for joining me right here on The Rough Cut. Rough Cut.